Thank you very much. Today is the 9th of December 1982 and on behalf of the Lightning Ridge Historical Society I would like to introduce Douglas Adams and he's going to tell us a little about his life here many years ago at Lightning Ridge. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Len. The first thing, Doug, if you wouldn't mind, we'd like to know your full name, title, please. Uh, name is Douglas Charles Adams. I was born in Renmark, 18th of October, 1916, and the official record says 1917, uh, the 17th of October, so I assume it was somewhere about midnight. Um, the other thing, Doug, um, now we know where you were born, you come to Lightning Ridge sometime in your life. Could you tell us what brought you here and how old you was when you came here? I was 17 when we came through the ridge, and my father knew one of the old timers here, I had met him at Corinda years ago, I had done work for him. My father was a mechanic, and a very fine one, a mechanic and a blacksmith. And um, so we came here to see him and ask questions about the area to see if we could get work. This was during the Depression. At 17, that would put me at, uh, in 1933, I think. The name yes. of the old gentleman that your father knew? I can't recall it now, and, and, and I'm sort of glad I can't, because later on he cheated me, and I wouldn't like to mention his name uh, and, and, and uh, then come up with some cheating tactics later on. <laughs> Well, that's how you come to know the ridge, but what made you stay here? Well, we came over and we stopped on the Nobby, of course. Everyone stopped on the Nobby in those days just to look over the field because these were the first claims that we came by. And uh, like all kids, there were three of us, my brother, Ray, who was later a partner with me here, and uh, my sister, Reen, who was younger. And uh, we scrambled over the dumps and we found little specks of color and we put them in a bottle and um, then we came down into town and talked to the old friend. I guess we must have spent four hours on the dump. And there was nothing here in the way of work, so we went on our way up through to, to Cairns in Queensland, looking for work there. We'd heard that Cairns was a lively place and there might be something there. Um, couldn't find anything there. We looked around for about two months and um, to get out of there, literally, I had to sell a uh, a fine browning shotgun that I had, an automatic shotgun, for two pounds ten to just simply buy um, gasoline to get back down this way. In the meantime, while we were at Cairns, my father had written to um, a friend in Walgett who owned a garage, and I've forgotten the name of the garage now, but it was very well known in those days, and it probably still has the same name now. Um, and a letter came through stating that if we came back, yes, he would have a job for my dad. And a job paying wages in those days was just something to be treasured. So we sort of jumped over the range from uh, Ravenshow, I think was the name of the town, somewhere up near Mariba, um, inland on the range from Cairns. And uh, there were just dirt tracks over the ranges in those days, and we literally had to take a shovel and uh, and fill in some of the gullies to get down onto the black soil plains again. Uh, I know we came through a bunch of stations, I think one was named Oxley, on our way to Hewenden. And uh, the thing that sticks in my mind about Hewenden, incidentally I'm 17 years of age still, the thing that sticks in my mind about Hewenden is that there had been a heavy rain and for some reason there was a plague of black beetles, they're about oh half inch to three quarters of an inch long, and the, the gutters in Hewenden were literally awash and full, which meant about six inches deep, with these black beetles, and it stunk to high heavens. And uh, we picked up more gas there and came on our way. But the, another fascinating part of that whole plague of black beetles was the fact that the, uh, a, a large brown hawk, literally tens of thousands of them, fighting for, out in the plains, they were literally fighting for a place to sit on the fence post. Uh, they were so engorged they didn't want to be down among the beetles on the plains. And uh, so it sticks in my memory very well. We came on down, it took us about two weeks the whole trip because we had a, an old caravan and, and the whole family of us camping out and the roads were bad in those days and if we did 150 miles a day we were doing very well. 
Uh, matter of fact, I think we had an old Whipper touring car. I'm not quite sure of the year. Um, we came back to Lightning Ridge, and Dad went to work in Walgett, but he left the car and my brother and me here at the ridge to dig. And uh, the family from Walgett and from his wages subsidized my brother and I to the tune of 30 shillings per week, which bought us rent on a, um, on a small shack, and I'm not quite shack, it was almost a cottage, it was two bedroom, had a fine um, patio kind of thing covered with, uh, with, with wheat sacks uh, sewn together. And it was sort of easy to keep clean, and I'm glad because my brother's a demon housekeeper, and I'm the sloppy one of the family. And uh, but it was a neat. We used to 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 um, uh, wet the bags down, and uh, we felt comfortable there. Was that in the town or on the field? Uh, that was actually in the town, and it was oh less than a hundred yards up Opal Street, uh, above the hotel, present hotel. A uh, big yard a well, plenty of water, and uh, from there we sallied forth each day. You wouldn't remember who you rented it from? No, I do know though that uh, uh, the old gentleman uh, was, was, was dead, uh, and, and I'm not quite sure who the rent was paid to. I just can't remember that detail. I do know that we were cleaning up around the place, a bunch of old boxes that had been thrown out outside the house, and I found in there an old Rotherham silver watch with a key wind up and a chain winding drive. A fascinating piece of equipment, beautifully made. And, and um, uh, bad luck to me, I, I just simply couldn't return it to anyone. I put it in my pocket and I think I still have it at the house um, where I live now, north of San Francisco in, in, in the States. Yes, that, that is another thing I think we should bring onto the tape here, Doug, is that uh, you have been living in the States for a number of years and you're back here on a trip to Australia. Yes, um, should I give yeah, that to him? I, I think we should yeah. bring it in there. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is a kind of a nostalgia trip for me. I've been away in the United States for 33 to 34 years. Um, I married a girl uh, from Kansas. I met her in uh, uh, the suburbs north of San Francisco. And um, we came back here to live and to work. And we found when we got to South Australia that we were, I think, seven years on the waiting list to get a house. And uh, with a baby on the way, we thought that was not a good way to live, just from hotel room to hotel room. So uh, we went back to the States to live. Matter of fact, I couldn't get back straight away. Wife went back, and I had to wait for a quota number. And because some idiot in uh, Washington sent all the mail involved, sea mail instead of air mail, uh, I had to wait for six months for a quota number. And when I got home, I had a big three-month-old baby to greet me. But um, as I say, this is a nostalgia trip. I've, I've, this is my uh, third trip out here in 33 years. And uh, I've just retired, and my wife just gave me um, a good swift kick and said, get over to Australia, get it out of your system, take a whole year, and go visit all your friends and, um, and enjoy. And I've been here now for six months and enjoying. And um, I do have some business to attend to back in the States now. Some things have come up, so I'll only be here for another two months. But uh, I intend to enjoy those too. Thank you for that little interlude. Now we will come back to Lightning Ridge. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we'll, we'll uh, discuss a little of the town as it was in those days. What you can remember, the shops, the pub, who was in the pub maybe? Uh, the town at that time consisted of in the main, two streets and a, and a bunch of shacks scattered round, not too far away, everyone under a wilga tree, of course. Um, there was, um, the Bruces were more or less the center of the town after the pub. Um, they had a bakery shop, they butchered meat occasionally, and, and everyone knew when they were butchering meat, and uh, we'd all go down and buy whatever we could from them. Um, uh, I was, um, at one time involved in, in uh, pulling a couple of teeth from a miner because the, the, the Bruces did this and the fellow who, who pulled the teeth was away so the, 
I was volunteered for the job, so I pulled him with a pair of uh, slip-jointed pliers. And um, I'm sort of rather proud of that. It's my only, it's my only venture into dentistry. Um, let me see. There, were, there was a second street up the hill in the, in the shallow workings, uh, but only, I think, four or five houses there. Then there are a group of, oh, four or five shacks scattered willy-nilly out towards Canfuls. And um, there was an opal buyer out there in one of those shacks, and I can't remember his name. Um, Jack Francis was the, um, was the other buyer. He had a billiard room, and that made it one of the most popular places in town, because what other thing there was there to do uh, except drink and play billiards? And at that time, I had... Uh, I had uh, I just simply didn't drink beer. I've changed that now, as you can see by my small corporation. Um, Jack Francis had the store, and um, I'm not quite sure of the post office part of it. I'm not quite sure how that worked. I think someone else had that, and it may have been in the same building as the store. But the um, the pool room, the the billiard room was um, just to the east of the store, where the present store is, right opposite the hotel. Um, Jack, as a matter of fact, had a, uh, while he was an opal dealer, had a four-carat diamond with, with a floor in the middle, a little carbon spot, and he was very proud of it. He sort of insisted on showing it to everyone. And um, matter of fact, uh, I became quite a, quite a, um, a pool shark at that time. Um, when I say pool? I once made a 50 break, and that's about the best I've ever done. <laughs> right now, I played a game recently, and I couldn't even hit the ball. <laughs> couldn't see it well enough. But that was about the extent of the town. There were some shacks out towards... Um, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the field north of Canfuls. Um, Potch Point, I think, out towards yeah. in that direction. Bald Hill. Bald Hill. Yeah, I remember Bald Hill, and then Potch, Potch Point, Point beyond that. There are a few shacks out there. Uh, we went to work immediately, my brother and I, at the Nine Mile. Uh, I don't know why. I think it's the fact that um, uh, we, at that time, were not able to get into the house near the hotel. It was going to become available in a few weeks, and there was a shack out there available. I think the, the Kite brothers owned it, owned the little shack. It was just a one-room thing with a uh, a huge fireplace, naturally, that you could sort of sit on the, the, the cornerstones and um, enjoy your cooking and enjoy a little warmth. Doug, I'd like you, if you could, to tell us all you know about the, the Kite brothers, their personalities, their names, if you can remember, what you can remember about them before we start talking about the working. Mm -hmm. um, didn't ever meet the Kite brothers. Oh. Uh, did know about them though from their reputation. They yeah. had a fine reputation. They were not there when you were there. At the no, time. they were not there at the time because we were using their shack and they were they were right. off shearing, I think. Oh, yeah. um, but they had a tremendous reputation for honesty and good fellowship, and um, we felt very comfortable occupying their shack. Um, Can you uh, describe their shack at all in any detail, inside and out? It was just a one-room shack, and I should imagine it was about 10 by 10, room for two bunks and a table and, and the fireplace and very little else. What was the fireplace built of? Um, the local rock with tin up the sides and um, tin on the, on the um, lead in to the chimney, on the slope into the chimney, but uh, local rock uh, on, the, on the bottom, on the fireplace itself. A bunch of, uh, of irons across the, the rocks to, to, to um, put the cooking utensils on. And there was also a, um, uh, a chain swinging from a beam up above and uh, so that you could uh, adjust your, um, your pots, your cooking pots. And uh, that intrigued me uh, a lot at the time, although I was not the cook. My brother, apart from being a... Uh, a very clean character was a damn fine cook, so I let him do the cooking. But that meant that I had to be the wooden water joey, <laughs> which was fair enough. Um, we found a little show just away from the shack, uh, a little bit of ground where one of the diggers out there, I think there was only one digger out there at the time with us, and he said, there's a likely spot there. 
So we cleaned out a hole, it was four foot ground, and uh, we cleaned out a hole and uh, started digging in, and it was an odd, an odd kind of crumbly ground, so that the, 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 the um, um, ground came away in tiny little chips uh, uh, from, the, from the pick, and it was gray, and there was a little bit of gray band up near the roof, exactly the same color, and um, my brother had finished cleaning out the hole at one time, uh, opening it up, and, and uh, uh, for some reason there was, seemed to be a false roof. There was a, a fold in the ground, and uh, uh, for some reason I made a bad stroke and I hit against the false roof, and 29 nobbies came down, just a hatful of nobbies came right out of there, and uh, we could see sparkles of color in them. And we didn't touch them because uh, we were too ignorant. This is what, in the first week we were here. Uh, so we got very excited about it. And we came into town, I think, uh, a day early. Um, took them along to the friend my father knew. And uh, he very obligingly said, I'll, uh, I'll look at them for you. Uh, come back tomorrow. And um, we came back on the next day. And... Um, he, he pointed to a, to a heap of trash on the floor and said, none of them worked out. Nothing worked out, not a bit of color in them, just some, some uh, pin fire that faded as I cut into it. And we were very disappointed and uh, went on our way and went back to the mine. We opened it up a little further and we found two more stones. And those two stones that we found were the most beautiful opal I've ever seen in my life. So I sometimes wonder what was in those 29 stones that we gave to the old gentleman. And... Um, one was just pure black, the size of my thumb, and I don't know how many carats that would represent, but it was a good big stone, and it had just solid green and Chinese characters all over it, flicking from one to the other. Magnificent color, jet black. The other was a, an, an orange windmill pattern, orange, yellow, uh, gold, green, blue, in a windmill flame pattern, uh, about the size of a golf ball and good and solid. It was almost a half inch thick. And I rubbed it down by hand on a, on a, on a piece of emery stone that I had. And um, for the green stone, we got uh, four pounds from Jack Francis. And for the big flame stone, I, we got five pounds. And um, that to us was real wealth, getting by on 30 shillings a week. But, uh, I still wonder what happened to those 29 stones. There's, there's two things I'd like to ask here. One thing in particular. Can you remember the name of the old gentleman who was still mining at the Nine Mile? Apparently he was the only miner out there when you went out? Yes. Um, no, I can't remember his name, but I have a clear picture in my mind of, hi of him. Um, a description doesn't do much good after all these years, but he was very affable. Uh, a little overweight, as most pensioners were, always wore a hat, uh, always seemed to have one day's growth of beard on, and I'm not quite sure how he managed that. But um, clean, raggedy clothes like all of us. Anyone who works down a mine doesn't have good clothes. And uh, always wore a waistcoat, and, um, but had a sort of a ruddy face. And he had a little stone that he had gotten out there. It was the size of a marble. And the color hit across the top, beautiful color, red on black. And uh, when he had hit the stone with his pick, he had taken out a quarter of the color. He, he just simply hit it in the wrong spot. And it, it reduced the value by at least half. But uh, he still kept it as a sort of a memento. He'd had it for a long time. Magnificent stone. Well done. Um Kite's hut, presumably, was the same one that was still at Lightning Ridge when I come here in the early 60s, because the Kites was living there. It was a very old hut, and you've described the hut very similar. And not only that, the ground just outside of the hut, away to the um, to the southeast, was four foot country. Now you may like to know that country was opened up by a chap here at Lightning Ridge in about 1972, a chap by the name of Bobby Ward. He took the top off that four foot country and the opal he got out of there was dream opal and the amount he got was dream. So I think your story could be reasonably accurate about your old friend not being too truthful because the opal that I seen come out of that open cut, the very ground that used work was unreal. Gem quality as you described those other two yeah. stones. 
Well, an interesting facet of that is that later on, this gentleman, um, we asked him, we, we, we told him, we'd like to see a fine quality opal. And uh, later on, he took us into a dark room and lit a candle and brought out a stone, oh, almost the size of a matchbox, with the most beautiful harlequin pattern I've ever seen in my life. And uh, I sometimes wonder if that was not one of the stones we Well, I lost. can assure you this, that many stones from that little open cut was bringing in over 100 pounds per carat. We're still talking in pounds, even though we've turned to dollars at Lightning Ridge for a number of years after the changeover took place. And I can assure you that many stones out of that open cut uh, sold over a hundred pound of carat, and that was a lot of money in those days. One stone was brought by Sherman in my presence. It was only a small stone, a little over two carat, and he called it the Fantasia, and he paid very, very big money for that stone from exactly the area where he used work. So I know the quality of the opal that you're actually talking about. Yes. Uh, I did find out when I was here eight years ago, just doing another slightly nostalgic trip, I was only here for, over here for seven weeks, I did find out that the country to the southeast had been opened up in, in what they call the Biscuit Band uh, shallows. And uh, I went out there to take a look at it because I was curious. And uh, I couldn't locate the place where we found the, the hat full of knobbies. But uh, I, was, um, I was fascinated by the fact that the Biscuit Band area uh, out from the hut had produced so much opal. I, I talked to some people out there. And, um, Very good. I always have good feelings about the Nine Mile for that reason. Where else did you work after that, Doug? Well, we went up onto the, uh, to the Nobby, um, fairly well over towards the downslope uh, towards Walgut, and uh, we cleaned out an old hole there. It was about 60 foot ground, I think, and um, there were a few little bits of roof that had fallen, but there were some tunnels there too, which were safe, small tunnels. It, it hadn't Actually, all been you're worked up out. on the hill, on the road towards Walgut. Yes, on the on the left hand side, going towards Walgut. Yes. Uh, we cleaned out another hole about 50 feet away and, and uh, got some air through, and uh, that's when we discovered the, 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 the properties of, of, of the draw and the draft down below. Uh, anyhow, we dug in there and we found some eighth-inch thick crystal clear color, beautiful color, and uh, had to cut into doublets. I don't remember how much money we got out of that, a matter of five or six pounds, I think. But I did keep two of the doublets, and. Um, my mother still has one now, a fine stone. Um, May I ask, did the doublet crack? No. Been seen? No. Quite, quite firm. Quite They're firm. still in good shape. Who worked with you, your brother? My brother and I worked together always. We never did work with anyone else. Uh, from there, we went out to the Three Mile. Uh, Jack Francis used to um, finance the uh, one of the, the diggers here who lived along uh, the main east-west street of um, Lightning Ridge, and I, I, I can't remember his name. He had a reputation for being able to drive 12 feet a day, and uh, his name was Walter Hagen. Uh, yeah, Walter Hagen, and um, he was a hard-working man. Um, was he a married man? Walter? Mm. Yes, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was. And uh, Walter lived, I think, next to Ted Brown, and uh, Ted Brown was the man who cut the Light of Australia, the one, the, the fine stone the size of a matchbox that came from the Grawan. Uh My brother and I sort of felt a little bit um, squeamish about taking money all the time from our parents, so I left Ray here to, to uh, fuzzic around, and I went out with Ted Brown prospecting new country out beyond the Grawan. And uh, we took rifles with us, 303s, and we grub-staked ourselves uh, by shooting kangaroos on our, to and from our way to, uh, to the holes we dug. We were looking in around about, oh, 15-foot ground, but we couldn't find a good level in, of, of any kind out there. It's just, a, just an idea that Ted Brown had that it was likely country, and that's the way get, country gets opened up anyhow. We dug a few holes and we shot a few kangaroos, and um, uh, came back here, and I found out in the meantime that my brother had been working in the uh, one-foot to two-foot level 
uh, towards the town from Canfuls, and uh, he had found a very fine stone. I think we've got 10 pounds for it. Uh, and that essentially is all the opal we ever produced. We did go out and dig in the three mile shallows. Uh, we pegged next to the Bruce's because the Bruce's came in one night with a jam tin just full of beautiful knobbies. And so we pegged next to them because we liked the Bruce's. And uh, we were digging down, I think, the second hole we were cleaning out. And uh, we came to a almost a concrete hard accretion, about oh, two foot across. And we were just picking our hearts out trying to get through that. And one of the boys came over and said, well, look, that's, that's just too hard. Come over a little closer here, and you can have uh, this, this hole on our property. So that suited us fine. That was closer to where they're getting the opal. We didn't realize at the time that the opal there was found in these concrete um, uh, uh, lumps. And uh, after we left, very disappointed in not finding any opal, we discovered the Bruce's went in there and cleaned out that pocket very nicely. <laughs> And, uh, and I think they got about 500 pounds out of that. Uh, so that's another one we missed through our ignorance and, uh, and uh, no resentment or no feeling of ill will towards the Bruce's there. It was just um, par for the course to do it that way. And uh, always have liked the Bruce's. They were just a fine, fine group of workers. Uh, we went from, we went from there to the top of the three mile to 60 foot ground, right about um, somewhere where the big open cut is right now. And uh, we were one claim below uh, where some miners, and I've forgotten their names, a couple of old timers, uh, were getting some good opal, and we drove up towards them. We sunk a hole, and I think we drove 50 feet without air, and uh, that was a sweaty experience. We did find some yellowish, about eighth inch thick seam, some yellowish color. Um, it was not quite suitable for doublets. It was not clear enough. It was not quite thick enough for stone, so it, it didn't uh, yield anything worth it done. It was just sample stuff, stuff to be thrown into a parcel if ever you did get a parcel. Uh, right about this time, we had word, um, at this time my, my father had given up the job in um, uh, in Walgett, and he'd gone down to Mildura in Victoria, and uh, he was endeavoring to make a living there. And uh, they had passed by uh, my uncle's gold show in Fifield on the way, uh, my mother's brother, uh, name of uh, Rudolph Priester, and incidentally his son Rudy Priester is working on the field here today. Uh, and. Um, Eddie Priester was, I think, 13 at the time at Fifield. Anyhow, we went into partnership with, um, with um, uh, our uncle, and uh, we did quite well in the gold show. And that was the, actually the end of my period here in Lightning Ridge. We spent, I think, almost two years here, uh, made practically nothing. Uh, we weren't living by our wits, but I, I tell you, we were, we were exercising all of the skill that my brother had in making uh, dishes out of potatoes and onions. <laughs> <laughs> what, you only use candles, of course? Uh, yes, we use candles and, and spiders, and um, very handy things for, for singeing bowflies, apart from finding <laughs> opal. Who done mm. the windlass work? Uh, we both, we took it in turns for the windlass work. We were both pretty good, um, pretty good um, uh, sinkers. We, we could sink a um, a 65 footer and then go down another 10 feet in the soft ground in three weeks starting from bare ground. I was the um, I was the uh, powder boy. For some reason my brother was always nervous about explosives and uh, um, being, a, being a hunter and a shotgun shooter and, a, and I loaded my own shells I just loved the power and, and the skill involved in, uh, in placing a charge properly to, to get out the dirt. And did you use the hammer and tap to drill the holes, or did you have an auger or something? No, we uh, we used the uh, the hammer and, and chisel yeah. to, um, uh, to to dig the holes, and uh, digging them to a depth suitable for the shape and and, and hardness of the ground, of course. But um, there's a challenge to being a powder monkey. That uh, and uh, if ever I took up a, another career, I think I'd be a yeah. a professional powder monkey. Okay. Was there many? Miners here in those days, the years you were here were in the Depression years, was it not? Uh, they were Depression years, and most of the miners were pensioners. Um, 
getting enough from their pensions to, to, to exist and um, uh, not reporting too much of what they found to, to, uh, to the government, of course, which is um, uh, pretty much standard procedure anywhere in the opal business. I don't know in terms of numbers. I could take a rough guess. Um, I should imagine there are about 20 to 30 working at the Three Mile. Uh, there are, must have been 20 scattered over Canfields up to Potch Point and through that area. Uh, one or two around the ridge to, towards um, Pony Fence. Always a couple out at uh, uh, the Nine Mile. Never anyone at that time at the Six Mile for some reason. Um, oh, I should say a hundred a uh, 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 hundred uh, miners would, would, would cover the whole thing at that time. Yes, about a hundred. Was Freddie Bodell here in those days? I remember the name, but I, I, I can't place him in my mind. Uh, there, there are names that come to mind, uh, like Yorkie, and I don't even know what his last name was or, or whether that was a nickname or part of his real name. Uh, big, tall, gangly fellow, dark. Um, I'd, I'd actually have to hear other names to, to um, uh, be able to remember them. It's 47 years since I was here. Even though I could take you to within a few feet of every claim I dug, um, names and dates are difficult for me. We're um, back at Lightning Ridge again. This is a small incident to do with uh, being here for the first in the first few days, uh, the gentleman who um, who uh, cut and discovered that the twenty nine nobbies had no value uh, also came around to us with a windlass rope, a fifty foot windlass rope and barrel and um, my mother was there at the time, and she 's a sort of a nervous nelly she doesn 't like her sons to get hurt, and uh, that 's fairly normal. And um, he approached the sale of this second-hand piece of uh, cable, steel cable, on the basis of sometimes new cables have flaws and they break. It's better to buy an old used cable that has proved itself. So I think we paid him um, um, seven and sixpence for the, for the piece of cable and I think a pound for the barrel. And uh, once we had the barrel, of course, we could put together some sticks and, and make our own windlass stand. But um, he was, he, he, apart from, uh, apart from, uh, from uh, his conniving with the second-hand piece of um, steel rope, uh, he did teach us how to put a piece of bacon fat or bacon rind uh, around the, the bearings to, to get a good bearing all the time. And uh, as a future engineer, which is what I am now, um, that always intrigued me, the, the business of a piece of bacon rind giving good lubrication and not wearing out. <laughs> I've heard that been before, being put even in the bearings of a T-model Ford. Oh, I've done that too. As a, as a mechanic, um, I, I've, I've put bacon rind in, and uh, they work quite well. Of course, you, you just don't drive like hell. You, you take it very carefully. Now, uh, Doug, you was telling me yesterday about some of the experiences on the Queensland Opal. I see no reason why we can't put some of that on this tape. Well, I haven't actually mined for Opal in Queensland. I've seen the Opal and I love it. But um, something happened to me. After the war, I'd saved up uh, uh, some money and I had been making, while I was at Lightning Ridge, I'd been making doublets and and uh, learning to stick them together. That's something you just simply have to do for yourself because no one ever gives away any information like that. And I learned to make a good doublet, and I thought I was a pretty smart fellow, and I decided after the war, I, with my savings, I'd been in the war for seven years, I was in the Air Force, um, I would take my savings and go out to the new field of Andamooka and buy opal and take them to America because Americans just bought opal like crazy when they were here. Uh, oddly enough, even though a soldier buys opal when he's away as a souvenir, um, American dealers were not oriented to buying individual stones um, which were cut straight with the Australian way just to get the best color. And uh, when I got over there, I just, just simply had to sit down for three months and recut every stone I had to a standard 
uh, ring setting size. And uh, Los Angeles, which is the biggest or the second largest gem dealing center in the United States, it took me two solid weeks and uh, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, two clean shirts a day in that smog to sell them $1,200 worth. And um, there's no future in doing business that way. Just I must have seen at least 50 uh, wholesale dealers in gems and, and findings. And uh, I started to realize then after that first two weeks that I was not going to make a success of selling opal in America that way. And uh, incidentally, that was proved right. I eventually went broke there. And uh, to compound the, uh, the business of being broke, I married an American girl and brought her back to Australia, dead broke. Landed in Brisbane uh, at the height of a coal strike and we almost froze to death in the town. And, um, but getting back to, to getting the opal at Andamooka, there was an old gentleman there by the name of Harry. He was 86, I remember the name, the, 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 the um, years, because he told me, I talked to him a great deal. He was almost helpless, so I lived just up the way. I'd, I'd uh, built a shack for myself. And um, I used to go down and cut his wood, and I had a few bottles of wine out there. And uh, every so often I'd take him down a bottle of wine and some oranges. And um, we used to talk a lot. He was a, a, an old Queensland prospector. And he gave me a, at one time, he, he gave me a formula for finding, uh, as he said, a good show out in the Kyabra area. And uh, I can still remember it. I wrote it down at the time. Well, actually, I didn't write it down at the time. But oh, a month later, I did. I wrote it down from, just from memory because it stuck there. And it still sticks there. Uh, he said, you take the road out past the Langra. Uh, that's a big station. At the time, it was 1,400,000 acres. It's still the biggest sheep station in the world today. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Anyhow, we went out past the Langra. And um, at the, the, the instructions said, Take the road to Greenfield Station, and when you come to the boundary fence, which is a five-wire fence, you backtrack three miles, look out to the west over a windmill, across the creek, and there's a, a, a uh, niche in the hills, a gully in the hills. Up that gully, there are good traces. Well, as, as we were passing Thalangra uh, and, and going up the road, they just happened to have eight inches of rain and uh, you don't cross any creeks and go anywhere with eight inches of rain in that country. So um, we, we, we got bogged down for something like, uh, we got bogged down in the creek, and the Thailand people knew we were there because it was the sort of the unofficial business of all big stations at, at that time to know the direction uh, of travelers in their area. So they came out for us in a horse and gig and took us back to the station and we were there for two weeks until it dried out enough for them to send horses out and, and uh, drag the, uh, the utility out of the stream. And uh, I had to drain the oil and put new oil in and to get us on our way. And uh, we went from there across to Tirachi Station, the Tully's Ranch. And uh, I'm, I'm just so disappointed that the Tullys didn't come and get us, get us because they had two of the most beautiful daughters you've ever seen. <laughs> and um, I was about 28 at the time, unmarried, uh, uh, footloose and fancy free. <laughs> and uh, actually the Tullys are delightful people. Um, we stopped there for a weekend with them, um, a long weekend, three days, had a wonderful time, and uh, then came on our way. I, at that time, was due to pick up a a uh, ship in Sydney, I think in about three weeks, and I had to get my mother back to Bury in South Australia, dispose of the of the um, pickup, and fly over to Sydney. And I made it with, I think, two hours to spare. You never, ever went to the show the old time I told you about? No. Uh, I, I had another try eight years ago. I came back here on seven weeks um, vacation, and I bought an old clunker, an old Holden, uh, which started like all Holton's do, just started like a dream all the time, even though it only had five cylinders that worked. <laughs> and um, I got out, let me see, I was on my way from through Tomb Pine to Quilpie, and it started to rain heavily. And I had, I think, three weeks of my vacation left, and I knew that I couldn't get across those black soil plains with heavy rain. So I got into Quilpie, and I filled up with gas, and I tore up the road with the rain pattering behind me, and I got to, I'm not sure whether it's Longreach or Charleville there. Charleville, I think, is the next town to the east. 
from Charleville, I cut down to the southeast to, I think, um, oh, I can't quite, Bollum, township about 100, 160 miles stretch, and I think uh, you see one signpost on the road. And um, I got through Bollum, and I was ahead of the rain by this time, and uh, filled up with gas again, got through Hebel. At that time, they had a huge dump of bottles outside. that had a camera, and uh, from there into Angleloo, and I was tired, I was just simply worn out. So I figured, well, I can make it back to the, back to the ridge. And uh, I camped at an old house, no, it was a, a little meeting building, I think. I camped on the veranda, and uh, I fought mosquitoes and, and, and spiders all night. And um, But anyhow, when I woke up in the morning, the rain was gently drifting down, and, uh, and I took off like, like a scolded cat for Lightning Ridge, and um, uh, I made it all the way through, got bogged several times, put it into gear, and got behind and pushed it, had automatic transmission, which is very good for bog. And I finally got to within, oh, less than a quarter mile of, of Lightning Ridge, coming in past the six mile um, on that road, and I slipped off the road and got down into the ditch and couldn't move it. And some very kind gentleman in a four-wheel drive roared by, and I knew he'd have to come back that way. So um, I, I went over and there was some loose wire on the fence and I appropriated a little bit of it. And uh, when he came back, I flagged him down and uh, he hooked me on and pulled me out. A nice fellow, I, I didn't meet him again. I wanted to meet him and, and buy him some beer and I just couldn't find where he lived because by this time, Lightning Ridge had grown considerably. Anyhow, um, I had three weeks to go to catch a plane, and uh, I spent two weeks of it at that time, eight years ago, and I spent most, I stopped at the Tram Motel at the time, um, with, with, and, and had long talks with Debbie Hodges about the early days, and enjoyed her company, but uh, all those, 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 uh, those little uh, trailers were just full of mosquitoes. I had to get a bomb and bomb them every night. <laughs> But uh, I did take the time to go out, and I got permission from someone who had been in the ground out there and, and owned the ground uh, in the Biscuit Band shallows, and I sunk uh, two holes. Yeah, for, at the nine mile. At the nine mile. I sunk two holes uh, out towards the country where they made the good strike and uh, didn't get a color. But I got very fit and sunburnt, and that's <laughs> just about what I needed anyhow. Anyway, Doug? On behalf of the Lightning Ridge uh, Historical Society, we want to thank you for giving us this time and this information. Thanks very much, Dad. You are most welcome. I have enjoyed it. I wish my brother could have been here to, to, to talk with you, too, but he was lost during the war at Rabaul, and um, miss him a great deal. Good, thank you. Operating, that was my idea. Oh, yes, they had it operating. I seen the tape run for about a half hour. Anyway, Harold, we're operating now, yeah. and we're at Lightning Ridge. And uh, the date is um, the 3rd of February, 1983, correct? That is right. Yeah. And uh, this little film that we're going to do now, this segment, is for the Lightning Ridge, Ridge Historical Society. That is right, for the, the Historical, Historical Society. Society. of Lightning Ridge, yes, mate. Okay, well, we're not going to rush not. and pan panic here. And you are in my office that has had multi-millionaires, professors, doctors, ambassadors, uh, professors from overseas too, in this beautiful office. And nearly everything in it, including myself, is over 50 years of age. In fact, that's 100 years old. I thought you were going to say antique. I'm glad you didn't say that word. No, <laughs> over 100 years old. Yeah, that's very good, mate. That's very good. Well, first of all, Harold, your name is? Uh, Harold Victor Hodgers. Uh, Harold Victor I'm 79 years of age and I'm semi-retired. And uh, you was born where, Harold? In Parks in 1904. Well, that's very kind of you. Before you come to Lightning Ridge, Harold, could you tell us a little about your early life, your younger life and what you've done? We worked for my father on the land. He drew a block of ground and we went on from there and different properties moved to different districts farming 
uh, sheep and the finish and moved about suffering bloody droughts uh, there were so many floods in that area but it's still the same old story of the good and the bad times but that growing wheat plant and things and grant and things are just the same didn't suit me so I disagreed with my father and rolled the bloody swag and I carried her a mile I was getting a quid a week at the time and I put her down and I said my guess I'll give her another go I went two miles and I stopped again for a spell and I said well this is just as hard a work it's working on the bloody place. I'll go back and get a quid a week for it. So I turned <laughs> back and said, well, I'll have another go. <laughs> that was the only attempt at carrying the swag. Oh, yes, very good. Um, Time went on and then I left again with the horse and sulky. And I've just had a letter from a cove that stooped hay with me, never heard of him. And that is 62 years ago. And he wrote to me before Christmas. He's alive at Warren. And then I cleared out again when I had a horse and sulky then. We were still getting a quid a week and he advertised for hay stooters, stooping hay, three pound ten a week and keep. And he said, you go down there with the men. I said, no, no. You give me three pounds ten a week, I'll go down there stoking. He said, well, you just pack your swag and get buggery. And I said, yeah, it's good. <laughs> so I packed up the sulky and away I went. And I said, you let me go broke too. He said, no, I'll give you a tenner. Good. <laughs> three days, in those days, a tenner was a lot of money. You're telling me. And I blew her up in parks and... I got the agent to ring him up and see if he wanted more good men on three pound ten a week. So I signed on a three pound ten a week. Come Saturday, I said, can I get ten bob to go to the pictures? You work Saturday morning. He said, when you pay me back that bloody ten that I loaned you, you can go to the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't long afterwards I left altogether. Yeah. Where'd you go there, from there, Harold? Oh, <coughs> floated round. I followed the races and with Jimmy Barker, one of the greatest amateur riders we have had at that time, and still holds records. Finished up a big time trainer in Sydney, won the doomed in 10,000 with Grey Ghost. But here's we mate, and we followed the races. It's good following races. That, that that answers the question of your interest in races ever since I've known you. That is correct. I, I did 12 months. I used to drink and he used to gamble. And I've seen that boy, and this is on record, at Canoundra, two-day meeting, and he rode nine winners and a second out of ten races. And we finished up broke. Where'd you hide the battery? No batteries, no, no. That's a big average. Uh, no batteries, never used a battery. I never used a battery with a horseman, which he proved. But when he did stupid things, got set out, and that's when we broke up. He went to New Guinea to ride, and he put his up with property there, put in the mule teams, took the first cattle over there. And when the war came, he was one of the last to leave lay. He came back, I struck him. Well, then he went horse training, and they gave him, you know, what do they call that? The war remuneration or something for his losses up there. So he started in the pub business and the racehorses. Again. Harold, um, after this very interesting life you had, somewhere along the line you must have heard of Lightning Ridge. And this beautiful opal. Ah, time went on and I went back on the land trying to grow wheat again. Then drought. And so I saw sheep. I saw wheat down to one and pork and some bushel. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is not a proposition. 
So I, I you turned it off. No, we're going. I just changed from. Oh, you want these little bits and pieces? This is leading up to something. Yeah, no, no. All we, all what we have said is on tape. I just switched over from battery to power. Well, it's power there. <coughs> Well, at one important submission, I advertised and, and put in pigs and the boiling downwards. Right, see you. Hang on, mate. Keep going. My mate never switched the power on. Well, I'm, no. not, I'm not getting any power. Have you got it off? Just switch off for a we're, we're still running well. Um, depression. And I was buying sheep for sixpence a head and under, boiling them down and feeding them to pigs. Uh, and man, there was money in it. Thanks to Mr. Harold Bell of Winscombe Carson, and I raise my hat every time I think of him. He was financing me three and six a head for all the skins. And he, Winscombe said, sell them in their time, and he kept them 18 months. And I, yes, he's a man, and I, so I raised my hat for him, a man that trusted me. So I then also started to sell for an agent at Parks, and I think to me, it's one of the most interesting little bits. I used to drive in 18 miles to the sale, Sell for Boyd and Clark, a very cute old gentleman, really. <laughs> and it came the end of 12 months. So I used to drive in 18 miles from back again every sale day. And I said to him, Mr. Boyd, now, you know, I've been selling there 12 months for you. I was wondering if I was worth anything. My boy, of course you are. Yes, he said, of course you are. He said, you know that bullock that we unloaded off the train? And we sold it a few weeks back. I said, yes, Mr. Boyd. He said, it made 39 shillings. I said, that's right. He said, the cost of sale yard, dues and commission. But he said, you get half of that profit out of that to you. Yeah. I got, I think, 17 bob or something for the year's selling. And I said, bugger that too. I, I'll have a go on my own. So that's when I started on my own. And H. Hodges and Co. and I still got the old stamp there. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. Very good. Harold, um, somewhere after this period you must have heard of Lightning Ridge. Uh, during this period, I had an uncle who had been up here on a push bike, Hector Woodhouse. He'd been through here, he'd seen a bit of Opal, and used to blow down my ear. And I used to look at it, you know, in the shops. And I thought, well, this is a glorious stone. Diamonds never interested me. But time went on. You say, why did I come here? Time went on, I went through ups and downs, and I, then the war came. When I came back from the war, I went into the second-hand business, and the city didn't suit me. I went down rock mining. Then I came back to Parks and started the agency again with very little support from the ones whom I had helped in the Depression. But I won again. And then I lost in 53, being too greedy. I sent two trainloads of sheep to Gunnada and the grass up the plague man. And how I remembered it's the year where Della won the Melbourne Cup at Hodge, he did 11,000 on the sheep. <laughs> yeah. And an old drunk saw me, I bought him breakfast, and he was gone. I think it was double, I bought him breakfast. He said, don't forget to make with Della in the Melbourne Cup. I did 11,000 quid, stood up and sold him my shop in Tamworth. Came back and did a sale. And, oh, bits and pieces that was from a storage shed and every night of my knock down to the old ladies and 
crop we and that. Don't forget the back medalla in the Melbourne Cup. And I never backed it, my bloody self. One bloody cup, and I think it was about 16 to 1. All the grandkids at Bark still come up and pat me on the shoulder. Ah, oh, mummy and grand tell us about you, Wadella. Yes, <laughs> Wadella. So then uh, when I paid back that debt, went butchering, didn't know where a chump chop come from. That's fact. But I got great support from the townspeople, from the Wadella element, you know. <laughs> and so when I paid back that debt, I said to Debbie, well, I'm going to have a holiday. I tossed the coin to see whether I'd come this way and go through the White Cliffs on the Cooper and end up or go the other way. I came, I come this way. And it rained that week. And I had, still had the slaughter business. I'd started a cove with a cutting cart. I had to go back. And so I stopped here ever since. What year was that, Harry? 1958. So you come here in the first place for a holiday? That's right. I'd done the same thing, Harold. Yeah. <coughs> it's and amazing I, the amount of people... You never there. mentioned, though, in that passing, I camped down here. I had the covered crate and a trailer. And old Joe Babang had the hut there, didn't I? I would like this. They all called him the village idiot. He comes over to me and I'm boiling the port of gas. He said, boil a billy on your gas. Boss, I said, yes, yes. Just kept dark, drizzling rain. He said, you got any money, boss? I said, oh, yes, a few more. I said, what the hell is this? I'm just in town. You got notes? Well, I said, two or three. He said, how many do you think? I said, oh, about three quid. So over he goes and he comes back with two bobs for the notes. I thought, what the hell is this? Question of what's going to happen to me tonight? <laughs> so next morning it's raining and he comes over again with more two bobs. I, I think he got a five or two out in the morning. So I naturally went down to the post office and asked who this guy was, what he did. He was a village idiot, they said. I said, I don't about being the village idiot. I said, where does he work? They said, oh, he's a useful at the hotel. I said, Take, that's all I want to know. <laughs> yeah, see, we've got with the bloody two bobs. I said, oh, yeah. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> well, that was eight when you were, but I know of. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, don't rub the pen on the microphone if you if you can help it, please, Harold. It records on the uh, on the sound track. Oh, oh well, I don't even think it's my voice. <laughs> that's all right, mate. Okay, <clears throat> well, that's a very interesting story, and you're the only person that's ever told us anything about Joe. Really, we've viewed other people, and uh, they've told us the other side of his life. That's a very interesting story. Uh, Joe Bavang was a gentleman in my book. He used to come here, he was kind to Debbie, and if you treated him with the respect and the kindness that he should have had from everybody, he was really a good person. Yeah. And he'd do anything for us. Yes. He had his own tank of water just to be on that front corner. No one used that, but I said, that's yours, Joe. You first, when you first visited the ridge, what was the first impressions when you seen those white mullet dumps as you come along? What hit your mind? Well, it was late in the afternoon, and I'll tell you, the first day it didn't worry me. The second day I moved down to the, well, just near old Jack Phillips. I think it was, what do they call it, the snake hole. Snake hole. Can you tell us a little bit about Jack Phillips, please, while we're on the subject? <laughs> yes. You're a mighty man. Mighty man. All you know, Harold, please. When I saw Jack, he said, no, he was a pensioner, but he was a gentleman. You could read that instead of you talk with him. And so my mother used to make a cake. I used to tell her about different ones. 
and they all used to go to cake and he used to get a bottle of wine and our friend Reese a bottle of soft drink and so on round them. And so I was always talking to old Jack and I said, Jack, well, like you the life story, I thought he's got something. I said, Jack, what made you come here? He said, oh, I just arrived. I said, Jack, was it domestic trouble? No, 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 no gracious, no. He said, I just arrived here and I drank a little. And I said, yes, Jack, uh, no women in your life. He said, yes, I tried that business once. And it's not what it's cracked up to be, he said, <laughs> and that's why I'm here. And that's a God's plate. <laughs> well, he used to pass my camp, and all the week he'd be crook on the two stick street. Pension day when he was coming to town, one stick, and he'd walk past. Three days after, when the plonk run out, he'd be back on the two sticks. But he was nature's gentleman. Uh, his sisters were very well off. They lived in Melbourne. And the last compliment he paid me, we came here, old Jeffries brought him up. He'd been up to the wish nurse and they'd rang the ambulance. He said, no, take me to Hodges. I want him to drive me in. But the ambulance was on the way. And poor old fellow, I was sorry for him. But he had, so I asked him about the flame queen, was it? Yeah. I said, Jack, give me the truth about it. He said, yes, we got it. He said, some of, you, some of them say I got this much and we got that much. He said, we got 60 quid for it, 60 pounds. And he said, we drank her. And he said, I remember, he said, it was that beautiful. I was floating off the floor. He said, I sleep on the floor, lying there drunk. And he said, you know, I was floating up and down like that. He said, in space. He said, it was gorgeous. <laughs> now, that's old Jack. Yeah. Oh, what a character. Unfortunately, he died just before I come here. <laughs> yeah, well, he was a mighty man. His sisters came, and they took him back to Melbourne. They were wealthy people, but just something happened. And well, that's Jack's idea of... Where was his camp, Harold? Just down from the Canadians. That's what I thought. Could you describe it as you see it in your mind? I can't. Uh, as I see it in my mind, yes, it's a little low. Uh, bark, it was then, bark and bits of stone and bits of mud and stick. And he'd get in and he had the stove. He had the fire there and nearly got burnt. Up there in time, but that's where the water hole was. They used to grow the vegetables then. But old Jack, no, she was rough. She was rough. But he kept himself beautifully clean. Old Jack, I mean, he had a bit of a catchment off the bark. He had water there and he had that little tank. It's still there, I think. I, I haven't made me afraid. Oh, is the camp or the, the tank, Harold? Is the camp still there? Part of the camp still there, you think? No, the camp is gone. Has it? I tried to preserve it. Mm. What a tragedy. Well, I tried to preserve it, and then the old Bedells. It's still there. I know it is, and still will be there, but his nephew offered it to the National Trust, and they nothing to do with it, so he said, right, I'll do it up, and I'll keep it for myself. Well, before we go on to some more of these characters, we've got plenty of characters to talk about. Just some of your impressions of uh, the town when you first got here. When I came here, I said, well, it's just as I hate to tell me, that's my uncle. But I think at the time he was out here, it was uh, some boom on, I don't know. But he, uh, he didn't fancy Opal. And he didn't stop here. But it was always in my mind, and I'll tell you, I didn't drink then. I and it took six months for the people here to accept me. When I'd go to that pub and I'd have an orange drink or a lemonade, 
and I asked you to put down five quid and asked him to have a drink. No way. Harold, um, the streets were dusty and dirty those days. Oh. Were the streets? Mm. Yes, there was one or two. One or two. And you could look from the west of Marilla Street and you could see Cantrell's, could you not, up the other yeah, end to the yeah, east? Yeah. You could see the mines. That's correct, that's correct. When I came here, you could do that. Yeah. But when I come here, there was a man called Harold Hodges who'd brought some trams here and started the first motel. Could you tell us about him? Well, yeah. tell us about him. And about the motel. Oh, and the I mean, yeah, that's different.